Osiris. Hi. Before we get into this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about some bonus content from Spotlight On. Head over to spotlightonpodcast.com slash blog and check out Bonus Tracks, the official blog of this podcast. There's special material exclusive only to the website. Have a look. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on Monica Erzig, whose career as a jazz pianist and composer spans three decades and dozens of releases. Monica joins us to talk about the release of a reimagined set of Joni Mitchell's music, which she arranged and contains vocals interpreted by her late friend, award-winning vocalist Janice Jaffe. To quote from the liner notes, quote, this album is first and foremost about relationships between Janice and Monica, between the stretch of time that gave rise to Joni's songs and the ones we're living through now, and, most of all, between Janice and these lyrics, end quote. Visit BothSidesOfJoni.com for more about this fearless and inventive album, and then enjoy my talk with Monica Erzik. So, we're here to talk about your new record, your new set of recordings. I was wondering if I could have your permission to maybe take the first couple of minutes just to ask you a couple of questions about your background. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Something that stands out in your biography is how you came to America. I'm very curious as to whether your arriving for school in Alabama was your first experience with America or had you been here before? <laughs> That was my very first experience diving right in <laughs> to the culture of Alabama. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about that. Tell me about that experience. Well, I mean, it, it was a bit of a culture shock, but it would have been no matter where. If you go somewhere and you just lift up and get one-way tickets and see what happens, you'll have to experience new things. I think it was actually a good thing. The University of Alabama is actually... Really good school. And they had a brand new music school just built. They had really good composition and arranging teacher who ended up the jazz department. Being a big fish in a small pond, I think, to get started was good. And everybody in the South is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> to your face. <laughs> Why Alabama? Was it the allure of the program? Was that what brought you there? It was the exchange program they had. One with the University of Alabama and one with Cleveland. So that was the two options. I'm curious also, in your non-performing professional career, obviously the word that comes up over and over is educator and education. I've been struggling with how to frame this question or to say it articulately, but I guess most simply, what does jazz education mean to you? Because I, you know, I think of it in terms of there's theory there's conservatory work, performance, but then there's also the element of the music industry work that you do or the classes you teach. And I wonder, just how do you think about jazz education, your role as an educator? What does that all mean to you? I come from a long line of teachers. So somehow teaching was like my destiny anyway. <laughs> and I love it. I have to say, being in the classroom, interacting with students is, is essential. In terms of what to teach, you know, that's been tricky. So I have to say I've never made it as a full-time job in a jazz studies program. It might or might not be my fault, but what you can see is that the history, when you look at jazz studies program, full-time instrumental faculty, it's been only very recent that it's been opening up to a few females traditionally this was a closed, the absolutely closed best. <laughs> mm. So me coming from maybe that generation before, I'm, I'm delighted to see a lot of the next generation once right now entering that domain. And of course, it has been a lot of talk and a lot of movement in that direction. And it really is opening. This is the moment. But for my generation, when I was in the job market, getting into a jazz studies program as a full-time faculty was pretty much closed. I was often second and third. Of course, you have to keep the diversity in who you interview, but 
it would have never happened. So I had to like carve out my space there. <laughs> and it's been working out. I've been with the music industry stuff that made a lot of sense because having to make your own space and figuring out how to create a career, how to lead bands, how to put recordings out. There was definitely a void for students. How do you do that? <laughs> and those classes have been really, really productive and collaborative. And and I must say, maybe, I don't know, it's hard to say, but m maybe I even preferred doing that than saying, okay, I'm going to teach you some more theory on how to play piano and throw you out in this field where pretty much 90% of you will not have a <laughs> chance. <laughs> it makes it feel guilty <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know, going on the site saying, hey, I have some tools for anybody who wants to create a career, do that, might have been even a little bit safer. <laughs> well, it also strikes me as something you said in there I would want to pull out a little bit is that there's plenty of people or lots of people, but there are people who can teach the music, can, can sit you down and give you instruction. But I would think there's a somewhat smaller subset of people who have that, but can also say, you know, I've lived on the road or I've road managed myself or I've booked a tour or I've negotiated with a promoter or whatever it is that you are talking about. And I wonder, what do you tell your students? Like, how does somebody stand up in front of a group of optimistic young artists and say something to them about the music industry in 2023 that doesn't make them run in the other direction? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I've seen them run in the other direction. <laughs> I mean, one thing to make clear from the very beginning, saying, okay, if you don't wholeheartedly want to do this and you can't see any other way <laughs> to create your life, go do it. But if you see other options, <laughs> go do something else. <laughs> because it's way too hard if it's not the only thing you can imagine. If there's other things you can imagine spending your life with, It'll be a much easier life. But if that's what drives you and if that's where you want to go, there are definitely ways, you know, the dedication is number one. And then just making it clear that you'll have to take charge. You can't wait or say, I'm just going to just find this booking agent or manager and they'll take care of everything. You will always be the one pulling the strings and making the plans and, and figuring out making a plan and treating yourself just like a business person would treat their business, meaning you make a business plan and you're able to articulate what is your business about, where do you want to go, how do you see yourself in five years grow. If you can put that in a plan, you'll have a path to go and you'll get pretty close because you know where you're going. Yeah. I think there's one other aspect of your work that you alluded to that I would maybe like to use as a springboard into a discussion of the Joni Mitchell album, which is your work around gender. You know, you talked about the narrowing of opportunity earlier in your career. Can you talk about the importance of your own work and your own position as somebody who is trying to create space and create opportunity create collaborative possibilities within your gender and how you have seen, if you've seen the broader support for you and for women change in the course of your own career. Is there cause for optimism? Is it just as difficult as ever? Like, How do you think about it and characterize it? I mean, obviously we've seen a lot of attention over the last few years. So, you know, we were seeing Everybody focusing in on it, but just the first direction for getting the change. And I would say right now there is good opportunity, but it's going very slow. <laughs> so we can't lean back yet and say, hey, we've made it. One thing, and I told you earlier that I realized when I started out in the 90s, I had like what Leonard Feather told Marion McPartland, the three strikes against me. <laughs> He told her when she came to play at the Hickory House, you know, you're playing pretty good, but there's three strikes against you. You're white and you're a woman and you're from somewhere else. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, yeah, that <laughs> sounds familiar. Realizing that it'll be up to me to create a space. So jazz is very much dependent on networks and yeah. 
being inside a network and, you know, the way you get hired, the way you get pulled in is by hanging out and creating those bonds and friendships. And traditionally, it's just been a dangerous environment period. When I did the book on David Baker, I got to interview a lot of that older generation folks and there are some terrible, terrible stories. Traditionally, it was just let's stay amongst ourselves. And a lot of these myths, I went to one of the clubs in, in Vienna and Friedrich Gulda told me many decades ago that women in their puberty, they just don't have the muscle strength to practice as hard as <laughs> a lot of these myths were deeply ingrained that there's issues with the instruments to play and muscles. You know, there's been enough studies by now saying, no, that's not the case, but it takes a minute to get those stereotypes out. And so what I've done eight years ago is I've pulled together a group called Shiro's, which is an all-female group, and not to do a gimmick, but uh, to go in against these perceptions. When you go on stage, people immediately, just because of the way you look, have some expectations. And so I pulled together the most powerful ladies I could think of from New York and said, hey, let's <laughs> let's bond together and let's go on those stages. And we went on some big stages, uh, including Egypt and, you know, Cairo and, and Alexandria. And there's Ray Wood with her trombone blowing everybody away <laughs> to bust some of those stereotypes to say, okay, the more we put something on stage that looks different, little by little, We'll get rid of these expectations. It's just deeply ingrained. And I'm sure everybody catches themselves even when you, a group goes on stage and you immediately like pinpoint some expectations of how this might sound like. <laughs> and that's been a great experience. And I guess I want to take the credit of seeing a lot of these all female bands and mostly female groups uh, come out of what I started. So I want to get take credit for Artemis following my footsteps. <laughs> a lot of ladies in that band were actually in my group initially. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I mean, that brings me to my next question, which is just by doing that work, you create a touchstone for other people, other generations to have, you know, inspiration from or to take motivation from. You mentioned Marion McPartland. Who were the people that you looked back to to say, well, she did it, I can do it. Or did you have female role models? So role models is a huge issue, right? And looking back, that's very few. And it's great to see them now. This is where you get that mushroom effect too. Now you have all these powerful role models. So you'll have a lot of following them. For me, <laughs> I remember going to this festival in the 80s in Austria. And there was Carla Blay leading her big band. And she was at Oregon with her big hair and conducting that whole band. And my mouth just went open. <laughs> I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> she, she was just so impressive how she was in control and the music and everything. I mean, for me, that was the inspiration. You know, it's funny that you mention her. The person that has that impact on me now, especially when I see her perform live, is Maria Schneider. She drives her band like it's a piece of machinery and she's in full control, yet the band members are still, they're bringing their thing in her composition. So it feels, you know, it's just her interplay with her orchestra as an instrument. And she's so small. And to see her on the stage, yet she's so mighty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really amazing. It's really amazing. This helps me set the table a little bit because I think it does actually provide direct context into this project being about women and women of song and women creators and, and strong women. But also you talked about like, well, I'll use relationship as a synonym for network. This is clearly about relationships, not least of which is because of Joni Mitchell's music. You know, she's not singing necessarily about the weather or, or fast cars. I, you know, something that stood out for me in some of the material as I was reviewing in preparation for our conversation was that there was a quote in the press release that said that this project was the product of a period of soul searching. 
that seems to be a few words that have a lot that could potentially be behind them. And I wonder who was searching their soul and why. Well, it was the summer of 2020, you know, what can you say? <laughs> we, yeah. were so, we were all wondering what's even our future. Are we going to play again? Should we go somewhere else? And this project, you know, I want to credit the idea and the initiative to my friend Janice Jaffe because she was the one who came to me one morning or called me at that time and said, I was listening with my son last night to this Joni Mitchell recording that I initially in the 70s took with me to Paris. And I was just realizing what these words mean or start to realize what they mean. And and right now we really need to hear this again because there is such a depth of expression that would help us get over this hump and figure out what to do. And so I want to dig out these songs and these words again, and you have to help me put them in, in, in jazz versions so we can hear them again and we can listen, you know, otherwise we can't forget about this is what we need right now. So that's the soul searching. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You raised something that I've actually been thinking about in the last few months about Joni Mitchell in particular in that she's clearly having a reemergence and there's been a rediscovery and a new focus on her. Whenever she pops up in the public domain, it, people get excited and those times were happening fewer and further between. But now there seems to be a bit of a moment. It's just so interesting that, that your project's genesis was during that time because I, I've wondered, is there a connection between our attraction to her and what we've all just gone through. Like those of us who knew about her and were familiar with her music or maybe came across her music. Like there's something resonant about this point in time and Joni Mitchell that I can't quite, I can't quite see my way through, but I know there's something there. And does, can you speak to that at all? Am I crazy? <laughs> no, you're not crazy. I mean, she has such a instinct and such a distinct way of pinpointing what humanity is all about. And what living and relationships is all about and even patriarchy and structures. Such a real gift in putting this into words, you know, and very few people have that. Just like in Sweet Bird, when she describes how time fleets and we can't hang on to time, it'll just go away and there's nothing we can hang on to. It, <laughs> it doesn't work. Or with both sides now saying, you know, and all let's go from both directions. <laughs> you can go from up and down and, <laughs> and all these ways. So she, she has a way of describing to us how humanity interacts and how we function that helps us understand and in, in images. And that's the responsibility of art. You know, artists don't make something up to share but they look at humanity to look around and it's like a mirror and they say this is what i see what do you think and with her real intricate observations this was the time where we were struggling to think well, what are we actually about what is this relationship thing how are we in relationship to each other to the universe to nature and there was a lot of mirrors and showing us, hey, think about this option or this option or this option. <laughs> yeah. Were you immersed in her music prior to this project or did Janice bring this to you? I have to credit them mostly to Janice. I'm I'm very much an instrumentalist. <laughs> of course, we're all aware and especially her jazz collaborations were something but really going deep into it, that was Chinese. And she was the one who picked all the songs and brought them to me and said, let's do this one, let's do this one, let's do this one. But of course, you know, once she brings it, then I'll dig in because arranging, I didn't want to just push some fancy chords on top and <laughs> make it sound jazzy. But this is really something where you have to look at what does this mean? What is she saying? And what kind of musical elements can I use to make the expression stronger? 
that's my role, not showing off all the tools that I have. We'll be back with more Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. I want to ask you some more about Janice, but while we're on the topic of the compositions, can you talk a little bit about what was your process of discovery? Meaning, were, did you find yourself surprised by the compositional structures or her use of phrasings or, you know, what emerged for you as you dug into these arrangements? Obviously, the way she uses her musical language is very unconventional. For one thing, because of her polio, you're finding different chords. And the second thing, because music really is just part of underscoring the word. So there's two extra bars here and <laughs> one extra here, and then it goes somewhere else. I had to be really careful with structures to figure out, okay, where, where do we leave those one or two extra bars or where that might they just be an accident and it makes sense to put it in a regular structure. Some of those revelations and then with the harmonies too. And some of the things are a little bit dated. You can hear, okay, this is 70s, 80s approach <laughs> of the types of harmonies like in um, Help Me. It was definitely early, smooth, fusion, jazz, the arrangement and you have to go, that needs to be brought into contemporary times. How can we like take the dating part away too? <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, it's funny as that song in particular, that there is always been an element that you articulated for me. Finally, there, there was some the word that's coming to mind is deficiency. And it's an awful word to use in this context, but there was always something about that song that, that did feel a little dated and I could never put my finger on it because it's not particularly a dated production or anything like that, but it's actually the arrangement or the act the actual composition. That's funny. What was the relationship history with Janice? Did you meet at Indiana U or like, tell me about your, your travel with Janice. Janice was one of my longest friends. So when I got to IU in 91, I think it was during the first week we ran into each other and she started at that time. So I started my doctorate then and she came in as a 30 something undergraduate student. She had decided after having four kids and running a preschool that she finally wanted to pursue her dream of being a jazz singer. And David Baker had invited her and gave her a scholarship and said, if you want to do this, I'll help you. Wow. And so her youngest kid was two at the time, I think, or not even two. <laughs> and they were all really close together. I met her. She needed an accompanist for her voice lesson. <laughs> and so I went with her and I played with her. And she had these lessons with this classical opera singer. He was a very conservative conservatory. <laughs> and they didn't really have anybody teaching jazz or that direction. So her two-year-old was crawling in the corner with the diapers on. And this opera singer was trying to figure out what to do with Janice, who wanted to study jazz. And then she finally said, what? why don't you just sing Twisted? You do that so well. Go ahead. <laughs> and we did the version of Twisted. And the lady said, that was very nice. <laughs> but <laughs> from the beginning on, we realized, you know, we have to find our spots here. And we've been collaborating all these years up to now a lot on just playing together and doing projects together. We had a jazz in the schools program where we would go to elementary schools. Bloomington is the space where Hoki Carmichael was born and that whole history in Cole Porter's. And then you have the Indiana Avenue. So we would um, put some hats on. I'd be Hoagie and she's Bix. And we'll meet on the IU campus and talk about playing for the dance tonight and going to the Jeanette Studios to do a recording of Stardust. And you could do anything with her. She would be game. <laughs> That's beautiful. Since you brought it up, could you tell us a little bit about Bloomington's place? I would say in jazz, but maybe more broadly, the American songbook. Like what, what is Bloomington's either contribution or where does it sit? 
Yeah, it's interesting. We always have these localities. Yeah. There's, for some reason, this myth, well, jazz started in New Orleans and somehow it hopped up to Chicago and then <laughs> went over to New York. All these localities had their very special history and contribution. Bloomington, Indianapolis area is really interesting because early on you had Hoagie Carmichael who was writing songs. He loved Big Spider Beck. So Bix always came and they would, Hoagie would get him some gigs. And then Bix was the one who said, Hoagie, come with me to the Jeanette Studios. So Richmond, Indiana was the Jeanette Studios. And the very first jazz recordings were done there. Jelly Roll Morton would come up. And King Oliver would come down because there's the Chicago Railroad. So getting in Indiana from the south to the north, it was the crossroads of America, which is still on sign. So the very first jazz recordings, King Oliver, Jelly Roll, are, are right from the Jeanette Studios, who are celebrating their, I think, the 100th anniversary this year. Bix took Hoagie over there and helped him make the first recordings of Stardust and his Wabash Blues and some of these things. And then a few years later, you had Indiana Avenue develop, which is around the Walker Theater. And Madam Walker was the first female Black entrepreneur who became a millionaire because of her hair products. There's a Netflix series on that. And so she built this theater downtown Indianapolis and the whole district around it became like the centerpiece of entertainment. And again, all touring groups, you know, this Chitlin circuit would come through the Sunset Theater, Duke Allington, Count Basie, everybody would play. There was a high school, the Crispus Attucks High School, that came out of a really bad thing that the city of Indianapolis did, which was segregate all their schools and said, let's take all the black keys in a separate school. But the teachers in that school said, we're going to prove what our kids can do. So it was these nurturing music teachers. David Baker, you know, had a lot of stories about that, but they would help and anything they could and made sure the kids would be there too and watch over the community. So you had a period where David Baker, Freddie Hubbard, J.J. Johnson, Flight Hampton, Wes Montgomery, <laughs> Larry Ridley, you know, the list goes on and on. They all grew up together. At the same time, they went to the school together and you could see what community support can do. There was a time when all the greatest jazz musicians came right out of this little district around the Walker Theater until a highway was built right through that district, like in many major cities in the 60s, cutting those communities apart. It's like a story we hear over and over. It was like a, a template that just worked its way across the country and literally cut those communities off. It's incredible. Yeah, it's hard to get. I forgot about J.J. Johnson. I, I'm a very big McCoy Tyner fan, and they made a couple of records together that I absolutely love. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Janice, if I may. Something that stands out in her biography is that it seems like, and I apologize if I'm overlaying this impression, please disavow me. But there seems to have been like a real like searching aspect to her. Like you mentioned having children and then going back to school and pursuing her dream and then pursuing Reiki. It, I don't know how to characterize it. I guess I would ask you, was it a curiosity? Was it a restlessness? What was her essence? Absolute curiosity and fearlessness, I would call it actually. She was very small and she had diabetes from birth. I mean, she had overcome so many things. Her fir first husband was an alcoholic. She had two kids from them and she ended up with three husbands. <laughs> She's ab absolutely fearless and this curiosity. And we kind of attributed we're, we're both Geminis. She was born on June 9th, which is Cole Porter's birthday. I was born on June 12th, which is Chikoria's and Jerry Allen's birthday. And there's a lot of great minds, Miles Davis, and it's a great period. <laughs> So we always attributed our curiosity to our signs. So we started having these Gemini parties every year. <laughs> we had lots of friends. But I, I would really call it fearless. And she was a Buddhist and she would chant every day. 
and being connected to your environment, listening to vibrations on a deeper level. I'm, that's something I'm not good at, but she was so good. She would talk to trees <laughs> or <laughs> she would sit there, meditate and tell me which things are aligning right now. And if she had a dream or a plan, I remember we went to this concert and Chikoria was playing and Jack Dijonet and Bobby McFerrin, they did this improvisation. And afterwards we were there and she said, let's, let's go backstage. I was like, I, I don't know. You can't just do that. Oh, let's just go. She would just go and I would follow her and <laughs> she would go right in the dressing room and talk to Bobby McFerrin because she did some cans and there was Chikoria and we had the best chat and nothing would ever stop her. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's amazing. I think the fearlessness is actually on display in some of these vocal arrangements. Because the easy thing to do would be to just not interfere with what Joni Mitchell did. I mean, that, I would think that actually would be the easiest thing to do. But she doesn't do that. There's definitely uh, her own interpretations. And I would think that that's pretty scary to <laughs> To take on a canon like that, with especially with a performer who has such a distinct vocal instrument. I mean, Joni Mitchell's voice is, it, it is what it is. It's quite unique. And so that does strike me as an element of fearlessness. Oh, absolutely. And then Joni's voice is this high bell-like voice. And then Chinese was more this lower seasoned jazz voice. I think the best you can hear it on this play is maybe in Don't Interrupt the Sorrow, where she really digs in and, and shows her fearlessness and her, you know, I'm standing up against patriarchy and whatever you say. There it comes out the best. So I would suggest just listen to Don't Interrupt the Sorrow and see how she takes it on and makes the words her own and displays who she is. I'd love to ask maybe a, just one or two process questions about making the album. You mentioned that Janice basically chose the repertoire and said, I'd like to do these songs. Did you then go away and work on instrumental arrangement and she worked on vocal arrangement and then you got back together? Like, was there collaboration on that part or did you, like, how did that come together? So she would pick a song. I usually sit around on the piano and come up with ideas and then I'll make a framework. On Monday nights, I always happen to drive south. I had this regular piano gig at this resort and it takes me right by her house. So so I would drive a little earlier and, and stop for an hour and we'll go in the barn because, you know, it was still COVID times. <laughs> so I'll bring what I have. Here's what I'm thinking. And she would fit the words on top and see how it makes sense, you know, and sometimes we'll have to adjust. And it's just when you're an instrumentalist, sometimes you do something where the words can just not fit in a manner that makes sense. So she'll let me know. I adjusted it. And so little by little, we just worked out more and more details on, on everything. But yeah, it's that was usually the process in the barn. <laughs> Did you end up writing out arrangements and charts or? I did. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. And at what point did the other musicians come in? So we had a performance in March 21 at the Jazz Kitchen in Indianapolis. So that was a date we had set. We worked towards that. And a few weeks before that, we started rehearsing with that group of musicians that performed for that. So much later in the game, but yeah. Vocals aside, will it be the same ensemble that comes out on the road for this to support the record? Yeah, most of it. Some are the drummer is going to be with us most of the time. I mean, we already did our Florida leg and had a rhythm section there. You know, economics are always <laughs> yeah. part of the game too. It's hard to put a lot of people on the road and sometimes you just have to work with localities. So the drummer is mostly coming with us. The sax player, he's doing one show, the Jazz Kitchen show with us. So my husband's going to do the guitar part. He plays bass on one of the tunes there. So he's taking it on guitar. And then, of course, we lost Janice in 
November. So Alexis Cole is taking the vocal parts. And I have to say, she's absolutely wonderful. The first few gigs we did, it was such a delight. <laughs> she's so into it and such a great performer. Yeah. I'm curious about, if you don't mind me asking, how did you go about filling the vocal role? Was it just, oh, Alexis Cole, or did you go through a process and that would be my first question. And my second question is, what about the vocal arrangements? Is the live show honoring the arrangements that Janice did? Or is this yet another take on the songbook? How did that evolve? So we're doing exactly the arrangements. We even have one tune where we'll start out with the recording and then morph into the tune just to acknowledge Janice and her voice and channel her then we added a few things that Alexis brought in. We added Woodstock, which is really fun. How I found her was more out of shock reaction. You know, when we got the call, it was November 23rd that Janice didn't, hadn't made it to her heart surgery. I had the whole release tour already lined up in April and it was like, okay, either just cancel everything and forget about this album or the opposite now double up the efforts and make it known and and the kids pretty much pretty quickly let me know that they really want to get this out and make it the legacy alexis popped into my mind because she has this uh, website jazzvoice.com and i thought if some person knows a lot of vocalists <laughs> then she is the one and i was just i just contacted her said listen to this what do you think do you have any recommendations and she listened and she said, oh, I love Joni Mitchell. Are you asking me? <laughs> I was like, I, I'm, I'd, I'd love to ask you if you're interested. She said, I'd love to do it. And, you know, and that was fate. <laughs> yeah. Are you able at this point in time to see ahead to your next project? Like, how, how do you generally work? Are you very linear or do you have multiple projects in parallel? And what do you think is next? I have a few in the can that I'm trying to get out. We did one on impressionistic paintings last. Oh. I'm trying to figure out a format because, you know, now you have paintings and the sketches and the way we interpreted it and putting it on a CD doesn't make sense. So I want to come up with some format where you see pictures and you immerse yourself and I need to get some money for that. <laughs> <That's a weird laughs> You need so, an arts grant for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's something bigger. But I'm thinking as is, you know, I'm always getting input. And then I, I absolutely want to do another Shiro's recording that that group is so wonderful. And it's been great to be on the road. And we got, we had such success with all three albums. They made it in the single digits in the charts. And everybody was cheering. And one of the tunes. It's on the, in the Terry Lynn Carrington's uh, one new standards book, which is great. Amazing. So definitely want to make a new Shiro's recording. It's always the thing these days. It's not as easy to make recordings anymore. It used to be you put something together and then you recoup your money from the sales and then you work towards the ne next project. You don't recoup anymore. It's it's an investment. <laughs> it's just one way. <laughs> it, it's only one way. And of course, it's great. You put it out and of course, you get to perform and you get to do all kinds of other things. But every time you make that investment, you have to find other resources because I can't keep spending my kids' college money on <laughs> making recordings. <laughs> <laughs> And it used to be that labels give you something to work with to get started, but that's a thing from the past. Yeah, my understanding, it seems to be more and more, at least in in genre music, that it's often either self-funded or you'd have to deliver the finished master or some, yeah, something in that realm. By way of starting to wrap up, the jazz tradition in particular, I feel like it's, it's this is a question most suited for jazz performing artists, and that is, how do you think about composition and new composition in the context of such an amazing songbook? And how do you balance your interest in composing versus plucking gems from that songbook? Is there a weight you have to carry as a composer? How do you deal with that? Like, could you talk just, to, I guess, broadly about the contrast between 
composing and, and interpreting? Yeah, it's tricky. Obviously, there is a canon of great music and standards. It's the foundation. And I always think it's very important to immerse yourself and know where everything comes from. So sometimes when students say, no, I don't want to play rhythm changes or <laughs> on these things. No, you, you, you got to know where it comes from and at least have that. But in terms of going into the future, I think we really have to create those new paths. Otherwise, this music will become museum music, you know, and art music. We can't just keep recreating another version of Stardust without showing a new direction to go. Interpreting is, is, is fun and that's the way we communicate as musicians. But if you want to move the music forward, we have to think about new directions. And I see some really cool directions in, in Europe putting other music and other styles in the mix. Say maybe there's lots more than the great American songbook, but there's other styles. Jazz is more this way of putting things together in new ways and in inventive ways rather than interpreting a specific canon. And this is how we move forward. I've been making friends with a great bass player, then Gina Schwartz, and she has a very interesting technique of putting layers of melodies rather than the good old, here's the melody with chord structures and going away from, and you saw over this form, but really interesting ways of morphing music in new structures. And that's, I think, where we have to go and explore. I'm still steep with my compositions. I mostly have formats, but what we actually did with the Impressionist, it was more sketches and then finding ways to bring concepts into it for interpretation. So I'm getting more and more into this more open-ended structures, and I think that's where it's going. But we have to be really careful to not make jazz museum music. <laughs> it's got to live, and it's got to show us new directions like it always has. When we were younger, in the 80s and 90s, I feel like the discourse around jazz was, you know, is jazz dead? It was the traditionalists versus, you know, it was like you're in the Wynton Marsalis camp or you're in some more modernist avant-garde camp. Big distinction between sort of, if you will, uptown and downtown, the concert presentation versus the club or something like that. Certainly as a listener and as an observer, it really feels like in the last maybe, let's call it broadly 10 years, plus or minus, there's a resurgence of jazz or jazz's influence that I don't think I was expecting to happen in my lifetime. The audience has aged down. You know, I go to a lot of shows and I see people from high school students to senior citizens. It's very gratifying. It's entered a lot of the, um, if not pop music, at least like contemporary rock and electronic music. There just seems to be a real, and I guess part of it is that adaptability and that ability to integrate. I wonder, do you see and feel that from where you sit? You know, I, I do. So I'm spending a lot of time in Vienna these days. I took a position there at a private university and there's a great club, the Porgy and Bess Club. And I have my little card. I can go there anytime. <laughs> <laughs> just last a few weeks ago, I was there. Mary Halverson was there and oh, wow. they born and then everybody comes through. I see that and I've watched the audience. And it's a really, really mixed audience and it's always packed. It's always packed to the max, which is great for Mary Halvers and Joe for Linda. Oh, I was there. Yes, there's good things happening and a lot of crossover happening. But as I said, we just have to be really careful with this not moving into too much into the art music and to the museum music. I, I watch my German counterparts, and they, for my taste, get sometimes a little too artsy, too. I'm just creating my art here, and if you don't get it, sorry about you. But <laughs> yeah, there's an intellectual element to it, yeah. 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 It's, it still comes out of, of entertainment. It's a living and breeding music, and it's a way, it's a music that communicates and is in the moment, and you have to bring in everybody there in that's in the moment, not just a smaller circle, you have a whole circle. 
that's an ingredient I think that has to be there. And if people feel it, then you get the younger ones in there. That's the exciting part. The history of the music as a dance music and then what World War II did to the clubs and to the big bands and how it moved into more of a, I guess, a cerebral setting. Like even the clubs of the 50s and 60s, it was all so like about observing the artist and not just flipping the tables over and dancing. And for how exciting all that music is and everything that's come after, it, it there is an element of the roots of the dance music aren't always obvious. Right. Thank you for sharing your time and this project. It's really beautiful and it's a beautiful tribute to a friend and a selfless thing to be doing to to carrying it on in her memory. And I enjoyed listening to it. I'm glad I got to speak with you and that we get to highlight it for listeners. So thank you. I appreciate it. And it's easily found. It's on all the services now and both sides of Joni.com. That's where all the info is and ordering info and I do encourage people to still get this little round thing that you can play frisbee with because that makes creating this music possible and it's a special thing and we'll be on tour all through April all the way up to the east coast we'll be on tour all the way in the summer in Germany and we'll be in London we'll be in the Canary Islands we'll be in Vienna so Look at both sites of Joni.com and there's lots of cool info. <laughs> well, we'll do our part there. We'll make sure we link to that and make sure people know where they go to, to buy those little round discs. They're not coasters, kids. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Monica Erzik. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, which is presented by Osiris Media. Executive producers are Lawrence Purrier, RJB, Brian Brinkman, and Matt Dwyer. Our producer is Michael Donaldson, and our theme music is by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Visit us online at SpotlightOnPodcast.com or at SpotlightOnPod on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Cyrus.